be the Norris Institute is a place for family, for patients, families, and doctors to work together to find better answers to Norse and fires. What is the Norris Institute? <clears throat> Until recently, we, we have been my medical advisory board and myself. In 2013, when my son Daniel was in the ICU for 79 days, <clears throat> one doctor suggested my son had Norse, but no other doctor confirmed that conclusion. At that time, Norse was not found on the websites of the National Organization of Rare Disorders, NIH's Genetic and Rare Disorders website, or even the Epilepsy Foundation. Almost a year after he died, one of Daniel's doctors introduced me to Lawrence Hirsch and Nicholas Gaspard, who were about to do a study on refractory status epilepticus. And we began to work together on Norse other doctors joined us. We, we called ourselves the Norris Institute and they became the medical advisory board. Together, we put Norse on the digital map. Dr. Gaspard and Dr. Hirsch wrote the first report of Norse on NIH's Guard, NORD, and the Epilepsy Foundation. We organized the first international conference on Norse and fires in Salzburg, Austria in 2017 and developed the Norse Institute website, www.norseinstitute.org. An international group of doctors led by Dr. Hirsch published the consensus definitions of Norse and fires in 2018. Doctors Hirsch and Gaspard are leading a multi-center study of hospitalized Norse and fires patients. We have held yearly professional conferences, launched an international Norse family registry, issued research bulletins and have awarded seven research grants for Norse and fires. Our first aim was to establish a professional community for Norse, to increase professional awareness of this rare illness, to integrate their thinking and language, to spur Norse research and to encourage collaboration. The publications about Norse have increased dramatically. We are starting to get doctors to finally use the term Norse with their patients and families. So families have a name for their illness, even if they don't have an identified cause for it. With a name, families can find the Norse Institute and we can help each other. The Norse Institute now wants to develop our patient and family community and integrate it with our professional community. A point I want to impress upon patients and families is their influence on the pace of research. Families may ask, why don't doctors give better advice about the progression or the treatment of Norse or fires? The reason in part is that, they, is that they don't have sufficient data to provide a good answer. Sometimes they don't have the money to do the research. Families can help doctors get a better idea of who gets Norse and what happens afterwards by participating in the Norse Family Registry that is online at the Norse Institute website. Every Norse and Fires patient, living or deceased, is valuable and should be included in this registry. There are other research studies that need clinical data and biological samples that you will hear about later in the conference. Patients, families, and, and the doctors must work together to move the needle in Norse. I've discovered that by working with doctors, supporting their research, sharing my experiences with families to develop programs like this conference, I felt less isolated and alone and certainly less angry. Instead, I felt inspired by the people I've met and gained a sense of purpose and hope. I invite you, families and doctors alike, to join me at the Norse Institute to contribute your ideas, to develop our research, education, and outreach. You can contact me through our Norse Institute website. Our next speaker is Dr. Krista Eschbach, Assistant Professor at Children's Hospital Colorado, University of Colorado, and EEG, EMU, IOM Lab Medical Director. Krista. All right, just give me one 
second. Um, so it's nice to virtually um, have a chance to meet each of you today. I wanna start by thanking each one of you for joining the family conference today. We have families and medical professionals from across the world with us here today. And I think it's a unique opportunity for us to support and collaborate with one another. Um, over the next two days, you'll hear from a variety of healthcare professionals and clinicians, as well as family representatives. There will be an opportunity to ask questions and collaborate during panel discussions and breakout sessions. Some of the information and discussions may bring about strong emotions. And so I wanna encourage everyone to please take care of yourself as needed during the conference. It's okay to take a break at any time if needed, or you can always turn off your video camera if needed. Um, I'd like to move ahead with introductions for the first day of the conference. We have a pretty full schedule both days. I'm gonna introduce everyone at once um, for today's sessions, and then um, they'll briefly introduce themselves uh, before their talks. Um, so we will hear first from Dr. Lawrence Hirsch, who uh, Nora already mentioned, who has a long list of accomplishments. Uh, to summarize, Dr. Hirsch is a professor of neurology, chief of the division of epilepsy and EEG, uh, and co-director of the Yale Comprehensive Epilepsy Center and co-director of the critical EEG monitoring program. As you heard already, he's also co-chair of the Norris Institute Medical Advisory Board and lead author of the published paper on the consensus definition of Norris and fires that he'll talk with you about uh, this afternoon. Uh, he will be followed by Dr. Coral Stregney, who is an instructor at Harvard Medical School and at Boston Children's Hospital. She's a pediatric epileptologist and neuroimmunologist, um, completing fellowship training in both of those areas. She will share information regarding what we know about who gets Norris and fires, as well as potential causes. She has collaborated on the case series of patients with fires treated with anakinra and is also looking at the use of tocilizumab in fires. Um, next, we will hear from two physicians, both currently at the University of Nebraska, Dr. Tereshenko and Dr. Ko. Uh, Dr. Tereshenko is an assistant professor and adult epileptologist. She is director of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Center at the University of Nebraska and also director of the Autoimmune Seizure Laboratory. She treats patients with Norse and fires and has a basic science lab focused on the mechanisms of autoimmune seizures. Dr. Ko was previously at Emory University and just recently moved to University of Nebraska Medical Center. She is a pediatric epileptologist and formed the recent fires working group that published recommendations regarding the diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment of fires. Um, Dr. Ko and Dr. Tereshenko are both recipients of 2020 Norris Research Grants that you guys will hear more about. Um, and then before our break for the morning, we'll also hear from Dr. Eric Payne. Um, he's a clinical assistant professor and pediatric epileptologist and neurologist at Alberta Children's Hospital in Calgary. Dr. Payne, in collaboration with Dr. Charles Howe, received the inaugural Norris grant looking at NLRP3 inflammasome dysfunction. Um, and he'll share some of that with you today as well. So I know it's a long list. We have one more person um, that I'll introduce right now. So following our break before our first family speakers, we'll get to hear from Dr. Tenille Gofton. She is an associate professor at Western University in Canada and a member of the Norse Institute Medical Advisory Board. She's a neurocritical care and palliative care physician with a research interest in Norse and status epilepticus. She is the principal investigator for the Norris Family Registry, um, which you guys will hear more about, but is an international registry of patients with Norris and which families can directly enter information through a secure platform. All right, so Dr. Hirsch, if you wanna get started. Okay, thank you very much, Krista, for all those intros. Um, I will share my screen momentarily. Okay. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank Yashwanth uh, Polaru, who has pulled all this together. And in addition to being the research coordinator for all of our Norse studies, he has now become a Zoomologist, learned how to organize this and do breakouts. Um, so he's done a fantastic job. Um, and also, I really want to thank Nora Wong again, uh, not specifically for today as much as for the entire Norse Institute, the entire effort. She has really been the inspiration and driving force uh, behind the whole thing. And it's really just been in incredible what she has accomplished. Um, so my job is to tell you about the definitions of Norse and fires and what they mean. 
Um, so I will try and do so pretty quickly. So um, you heard back in 2018, we published these definitions. It was really the first time there was ever a consensus definition of uh, Norse and fires. They'd been used all kinds of terms prior to that. Um, and this came out of a meeting funded by the Norse Institute in Salzburg, Austria. Um, so the main purpose was to uh, to find this condition so we could really study it scientifically, to improve communication, to actually have something you could look up so both families and professionals can actually uh, look it up and find what, what the, what's known about it. Um, and ultimately to allow things like creating an institute, doing fundraising, uh, which furthers research again. Um, and we think by identifying it and naming it early, we actually can help with treatment and recent research has supported that the earlier treatment seems to do better. So this was a huge effort. There were uh, eight countries involved. About half of the people were pediatric. There are all the names in red here. And the rest were adults and some were critical care and some were epilepsy people. Um, it was endorsed by the Critical Care EEG Monitoring Research Consortium. That's a, a consortium with more than 50 member centers that do research on all kinds of critical care, epilepsy and EEG issues. So this was the definition. So Norse was defined as a clinical presentation, not a specific diagnosis in a patient without active epilepsy or other pre-existing relevant neurologic disorders with new onset of refractory status epilepticus, I'll define that in a second, without some other obvious explanation, like an acute bleed into their head or an overdose of some drug that causes seizures. So uh, refractory means you have to have failed at least two IV medications, intravenous medications. And status epilepticus is defined as prolonged seizures. So that either means one convulsive seizure where you're stiff and shaking all over for more than five minutes or any kind of seizure that lasts 10 minutes or longer. Um, the other way you can qualify as having status epilepticus is to have back-to-back -back seizures without fully waking up between them. Um, it can take up to 72 hours to rule out all these obvious things. It's usually you can do it in 24 hours or so, but we allow up to 72 hours. You can have uh, viruses and autoimmune syndromes that present as Norse. So you can have an anti, for example, anti-NMDA syndrome, a fairly common autoimmune syndrome, can present as Norse. Um, and you do need imaging. It's usually an MRI scan of the brain uh, and a lumbar puncture to rule out these other causes in order to be able to diagnose Norse. Um, other points is it's typically what qualifies as super refractory status and the super part means you you were still seizing after 24 hours of anesthesia, um, but that's not required to qualify as Norse. It just has to be refractory, meaning failing two drugs. And then there's another term called uh, cryptogenic, which means no explanation was ever found. So after extensive workup, you don't find any explanation. It's called cryptogenic Norse or Norse of unknown etiology. And at least, uh, at least half of cases of Norse right now seem to be cryptogenic. Uh, so fires is a related syndrome. It's now defined as a subcategory of Norse. And really all it is is Norse with prior fever or prior febrile infection. That just means infection with fever. And that fever had to, had to start at least 24 hours prior to the seizures. So it could be up to two weeks prior, but it had to be at least 24 hours. So not just an hour before they started seizing or not at the same time of seizures. That's actually what's known as just prolonged febrile seizures or febrile convulsions, which is a common, usually benign uh, process that happens in young kids. Um, it does have to be refractory status. And now both Norse and fires, the terms apply at any age in older literature. And in the past, pretty much fires was used in kids and Norse was used in adults, but they were uh, either exactly the same or very similar. So now they're defined to be used at all ages. Um, and it doesn't matter whether or not you have fever at the time that you start having seizures, as long as you've had it for at least 24 hours, it would qualify as fires. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. I already mentioned all this, I believe. The definitions of refractory, super refractory, and the only other word that's defined was prolonged, which meant it lasted at least seven days. Um, the peak incidence seems to be in school age children, young adults, and then a separate peak in uh, older adults, which is a little less studied group, but we're actually seeing that in our prospective study as well. And overall, it represents about 20% of cases of refractory status, which is over 3,000 cases a year in the US by our estimate. Um, as I mentioned, some kind of cause is ultimately identified in almost 50% of cases. It's usually some antibody or an autoimmune process or paraneoplastic, meaning there's a tumor that triggers an immune response. Um, it's usually prolonged refractory status. It's usually super refractory, meaning you needed anesthesia. Um, and it's a terrible disorder. The in-hospital mortality is about 20%. Long-term disability in uh, about half of survivors, maybe more, and chronic epilepsy in the majority of them. There is no specific treatment, although these are the things commonly used, steroids, uh, IV immunoglobulin, plasmapheresis, and more recently, ketogenic diet, and then some specific uh, inflammatory medications, anakinra and tocilizumab. So with that, I will stop. Did you, did you want me to take any questions now or that's for later? That's for just a little bit, but thank you for that great uh, introduction. I think next we'll have up Dr. Stredney who will go over a little bit more about who gets uh, Norris and fires and the causes. Great, are you guys able to see my screen okay? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Coral Stredney, and I'm a pediatric epileptologist and neuroimmunologist at Boston Children's Hospital. And I'll be discussing who gets Norse and fires and what are the causes. So as a brief overview, we'll again touch on certain aspects of the Norse and fires definitions that Dr. Hirsch just introduced. We'll review who gets and what causes Norse and fires discuss a general diagnostic approach and other possible diagnoses to consider in these patients, and finally end with some hypotheses as to the causes of cryptogenic norsen fires. So as we just reviewed, the definitions of norsen fires were recently standardized by an expert panel. And I'd like to highlight certain portions of these definitions, as Dr. Hirsch did, noting that NORS should be without structural, toxic, or metabolic cause, such as a brain tumor or low blood sugar, for instance. However, viral infections and autoimmune causes were included as potential causes of NORS, even if they're identified within the first few days of seizure onset. And these were intentionally included so that the definition didn't need to change based on our very rapidly evolving understanding of the field of autoimmune neurology, meaning that we don't need to adapt our definition in the setting of newly discovered autoimmune diseases or rely on the ability to, to obtain specialized testing for these diseases at various locations around the world. And lastly, it's not always clear that certain infections or all detected antibodies are directly causative of norser fires. And so finding one of these antibodies shouldn't rule out a diagnosis of norse. And like we just discussed, fires has been defined as a subcategory or subset of norse with fever that onsets 24 hours to two weeks before seizure onset. And although we commonly think of this as being a childhood disease, within the standardized definition, there is no age restriction. However, before the standardization, Norse was typically thought of as an adult disease and fires as a childhood disease. And most large series that are published in the literature include only adults or children and not both. And so the remaining of the talk is based on currently available data but I'd like to highlight that inclusive perspective research, like what's being led by Drs. Hirsch and Gaspard is direly needed to study these patients across the lifespan so that we can better understand similarities or differences between Norse and fires. And so going into a bit more detail about who gets Norse and fires. So starting with Norse, the incidence or how many patients have this isn't specifically known, but it's been shown to account for up to 20% of cases of refractory status epilepticus. And it's typically thought of as affecting young adults, 
but a larger study has shown a peak in older adults around 65 years of age as well, in addition to these younger patients in their 20s. There's a slight female predominance, and it typically affects previously healthy people, with a fever often being present but not required. And on the other hand, the incidence of fires has been estimated to be one in a million, so it's a very rare disease. This tends to affect school-age children with a median age of about eight years. And compared to Norse, there's a slight predominance in boys. There are also similarly previously healthy patients and by definition of fires have a preceding fever that's often associated with some kind of illness. So what causes Norse? In one of the largest series of adults with Norse that was led by Dr. Gaspard and his team, a cause was identified in about half of these adults. And when it was identified, the most common cause was autoimmune encephalitis. And that occurs when in a person's immune system accidentally forms antibodies against their own brain. And autoimmune encephalitis can be either perineoplastic or associated with some kind of tumor in the body or non-perineoplastic. And it was about evenly split in this study and the most common form of autoimmune encephalitis that was seen was anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. And another 8% of patients were found to have infection-related Norse, with the most common infections reported being Epstein-Barr virus, or the monovirus, varicella zoster virus, which is the virus that causes the chickenpox, and mycoplasma. And the other half of patients were considered to have cryptogenic Norse without a clear cause despite the extensive workups that they had. So comparatively, most published cases of fires don't have a readily identifiable cause. And this discrepancy between Norse and fires could be due to a few factors. First, there might be a publication bias of what's reported in the literature with a stronger presence of fires cases without known cause. And you can, con can consider an example where a case of autoimmune encephalitis may actually meet the definition of fires that's been recently proposed and present as a Norse phenotype but it's diagnosed and reported in the literature as autoimmune encephalitis instead, and so it never makes it into a FIRE study. Additionally, patients could receive slightly variable workups depending on different hospital protocols and the availability of labs. And finally, many of the published FIRE series are now several years old, and our knowledge and understanding of autoimmune neurology is so rapidly evolving, and we have many more diagnostic tests available now than even five years ago, for instance. Now let's briefly review at the diagnostic approach to fires in Norse patients and other diagnoses to consider when these patients present to the hospital. As we've discussed, patients with fires in Norse are previously healthy individuals who present with seizures that can increase over a few days and ultimately culminate in refractory status epilepticus. And they tend to have a monosymptomatic course of seizures only with lack of other neurologic signs or symptoms. And when they first present many studies, including an EEG or brainwave test, brain MRI, and numerous blood and spinal fluid tests are initiated to assess for a cause, including looking for genetic or, neuro, or genetic or metabolic disease, and importantly, considering infectious and autoimmune encephalitis. I'd like to pivot for a second to talk about autoimmune encephalitis, as this is a common cause of Norse in adults, and it's considered in children with fires, particularly early in their course. Compared to fires patients, those with autoimmune encephalitis tend to have a polysymptomatic presentation or one with multiple different neurologic symptoms, which can include behavior change or other psychiatric symptoms, abnormal movements of the body, insomnia or other changes in their sleep pattern, dysautonomia, which is a change in the regulation of the body's blood pressure and heart rate, in addition to seizures. And autoimmune encephalitis, like I said, is caused by the immune system accidentally making antibodies against one own, one's own brain. And so unlike fires in Norse, many of these patients can be clearly diagnosed on the basis of finding this antibody in the blood or spinal fluid. The most common type that is seen with Norse, like we said, is anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. And these patients can respond to other treatments, including steroids, IVIG, plasma exchange, and rituximab, amongst others which are less likely to be overly effective in patients with fires or Norse, if not caused by autoimmune encephalitis. So then what happens when all of this workup reveals no other diagnosis or cause? We call this cryptogenic Norse and fires. 
And as we saw, this represents most of the reported virus cases in the literature and about half of NORS cases. And current hypotheses in the field are that these cryptogenic cases are due to a combination of immune system dysregulation that might be triggered by some sort of infection and a genetic predisposition. So I'll briefly touch on these two things that will be further elaborated in subsequent talks today. So very simply speaking, in terms of the immune system, there's two different arms. The innate immune system is a nonspecific and immediate response to an infection, and it acts with the help of cytokine signaling. And some key players that you'll hear more about later are interleukin-1 beta and interleukin-6. These are immune system messenger molecules that we call cytokines, and they increase during states of inflammation. On the other hand, the adaptive immune system is the slower and more specific response to an infection. It involves T cells and B cells that are important for antibody production. This is implicated in about the 35% of NORS patients who have autoimmune encephalitis, but is rarely reported with fires cases. And we think it's the innate immune system that is at play in dysfunctioning in patients with cryptogenic NORS and fires. So thinking about the innate immune system as others we'll discuss in more detail later, there has been many patients with fires or NORS that have been shown to have elevated levels of some of these pro-inflammatory messenger molecules or cytokines, including interleukin-1 beta and interleukin-6. Another group of patients with fires had other elevated markers of inflammation in their blood that we call neopterin in, CX, in the spinal fluid and CXCL8. And they met criteria for a disorder called hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, or HLH, that's driven by an abnormal immune system. And so this further adds to our theory of immune system dysfunction. We also wonder if there's a genetic basis that predisposes patients to getting NORS or fires, although the exact nature of this is not yet understood. Some of the larger studies that looked at this haven't found any pathogenic or clearly causative genetic changes in patients with fires and specific genes that have been associated with fever-related seizures and other epilepsy syndromes, including genes called PCDH19, SCN1A, and POLG were specifically evaluated in patients with fires and no causative or pathogenic variants were found. However, a few smaller studies have reported some interesting findings, including changes in a gene called IL-1RN, and this is important for encoding a molecule called interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, which is responsible for turning off the inflammatory cascade caused by interleukin-1 beta. And we wonder if this lack of an off switch in the inflammation cascade is, is contributing. And we're also analyzing another cohort of patients with fires at Boston Children's Hospital, and those results are currently pending. And so these are exciting potential genetic clues, but they still require further investigation. And as you'll hear in some upcoming talks, these are particularly of interest because they might be targets for potential treatment. And so taken together, our thoughts and hypothesis of cryptogenic fires in Norse are summarized here. Some kind of infection and or a genetic predisposition starts the pathway by releasing some inflammatory molecules that inactivates the innate arm of the immune system. And this might include specific pathways such as interleukin-1 beta and interleukin-6. And this then leads to the onset of seizures. And then there is a lack of anti-inflammatory modulators or off switches to stop this system. And this then allows the cascade to propagate to the point of refractory status epilepticus that we call fires or NORS. Then we think that the seizures themselves cause even more inflammation and this continues in a self-propagating fashion. And so in conclusion, I'm hopeful that our increasing knowledge of this cycle will allow us to better understand this disease, what causes it, and who's at risk to guide more targeted and effective therapies and hopefully improve outcomes in these patients. Thanks so much. I'll pass it off. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, that was very helpful. Um, the next um, person will be Dr. Tereshenko to talk about uh, why people die from Norse and fires. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Is my slides on the screen? Okay. Yes. 
Perfect. So uh, we will be talking together with Dr. Sukiko. I'm Olga Tarashenko. I'm an adult epileptologist at the University of Nebraska. I also have a lab here and I study uh, mechanisms of seizures and noise and fires. And um, we will start with um, kind of a general perspective that is shared among adult and pediatric patients. And then Dr. Ko will continue on um, it, with some um, um, specific remarks um, in regards of the pediatric patients. So really uh, the mortality is um, high in Northern Fires and Dr. Hirsch already pointed out to these numbers. In acute stage, we think that mortality reaches about 3% and in chronic stage, it can be as high as 13%. And uh, really what is going on as many speakers have already pointed out is severe um, um, uncontrolled seizures. And you see this um, um, beautiful drawing of one of the um, autoimmune encephalitis survival, 16-year-old Grace Flynn, um, uh, who presented this um, kind of um, interesting drawing during the visual art show um, on the encephalitis uh, website. So if you're interested to read the stories of these patients, um, I, can, um, I can share the website later. Um, now, the causes of death can be broadly placed into two categories, seizure-related and medical complications related. And uh, as far as seizure-related causes of death um, in northern fires, we frequently encounter intracranial bleeding, which can be caused by either severe seizures or by uh, aggressive treatments uh, for seizures that can bring the blood pressure up and down and intracerebral blood flow up and down, and this way can cause intracranial bleeding or from some uh, severe blood, um, um, blood clotting dysfunction that can occur in later stages of the disease. We also often see a progressive brain volume loss in patients or brain swelling, which is kind of the opposite spectrum. And we don't quite understand what's um, causing uh, particularly this um, loss of brain volume or um, you know, atrophy, how we related it. Now, uh, oftentimes we see complications from anti-seizure ter therapy that includes again, fluctuations and blood pressure in cerebral blood flow <clears throat> and uh, many other different complications that we will talk about in, in a few slides. And then medical complications are related to uh, prolonged mechanical ventilation or having a breathing tube oftentimes we need to keep patients um, on mechanical ventilation for many weeks or even months. Uh, patients can die from cardiac arrhythmia or abnormal heart rhythm, as well as multiple organ failure, which may include liver, kidney, and um, um, heart. And uh, frequently, um, the infections can arise. Um, systemic infections such as sepsis can uh, be found in up to 30% of patients. Um, in patients in the ICU, we see urinary tract infections and uh, pneumonia, which is frequently related to the prolonged um, ventilation. Uh, so the complications of mechanical ventilation are kind of shared among many conditions. They're not unique to north or, or fires, but uh, it's worth pointing out that duration of mechanical ventilation in north and fires can reach up to 40 days in some patients. And the risk of infection uh, typically increases after the first two days of mechanical ventilation. And in patients with NORS, overall risk of pneumonia can reach uh, 27 or 30% with mortality as high as 50%. And we also know that the risk of infection in patients with NORS increases with the depth of medication induced coma. And this is something that I have a slide on later on uh, we oftentimes would uh, resort to medication-induced coma, and that further leads to higher rate of infection. A couple of words about abnormal heart rhythm and multiple organ failure in northern fires. Uh, we know that cardiac rhythm um, can be disturbed by, um, again, uh, specific treatments for seizures, but it can also be um, disrupted directly by seizures. It's so-called a neurocardiogenic cause of arrhythmias. And um, it can include um, complete cessation of heartbeat or, or cardiac arrest in some patients, and that uh, uh, can uh, lead to demise. 
and multiple organ failure include um, liver failure, uh, again, from uh, multiple medications or just from the disturbance of the blood supply. Um, it will lead to enlargement of liver, jaundice, and uh, sometimes irreversible failure. We oftentimes see kidney failure and um, heart failure in these patients, and that can independently um, increase mortality. I earlier mentioned this progressive loss of uh, brain volume in some patients, and sometimes we see death of the brain tissue or necrosis. And this is a representative um, uh, MRI of one of the patients, um, 18 year, 18 months old child with um, Norris that um, on admission in this left uh, panel had relatively normal appearance of the brain. And again, um, if you're not familiar with an MRI, this is a horizontal slice of your brain with this uh, front being your uh, nose uh, or facial part and the back being occiput. And so uh, you see the bone around it and the, the brain is kind of nicely feeling the, the bone space or, or, or skull uh, cavity. And then as, uh, as the disease goes by and as the seizures persist, you see these changes, bright changes, which may probably indicate inflammation. And um, in, in a few weeks, what we see is enlargement of the spaces that contain cerebral fluid and then uh, shrinking of the brain tissue itself along with very pronounced uh, patches of this signal change, which may indicate either inflammation or even a brain, brain cell loss or necrosis, how we call it. And so we don't quite understand why that occurs. It can be directly caused by seizures or maybe there are some um, direct effects of, of the disease itself that we're not familiar with yet. And we also don't know whether it can directly contribute to deaths in northern fires. And then just a couple of words about treatment of seizures. And we know that uh, anti-seizure treatment in northern fire carries high morbidity because we have to resort, resort to big guns. So we usually start with uh, so-called pistols or benzodiazepines, you know, medications that oftentimes used for other conditions, maybe for anxiety and panic attack. And um, this is usually our first line of treatment in uh, seizures when patient comes through the emergency department. And then in a few hours, if seizures persist, then we kind of resort to the next level or we pull up the automatic gun. Uh, and then um, with this, um, sometimes uh, the IV access is required and we sometimes start the medication. Um, IV uh, either scheduled or, or nearly continuous. And um, if we are unsuccessful uh, within a couple hours, we pull up the um, you know, granite launcher or bazooka and we put patients on medication induced coma and that carries very high risk of complications. And unfortunately, in northern fires, these larger guns are required in about 25 to 100% of patients. And so um, you can see how we go stepwise, sometimes very quickly within 24 hours, going from pistol to the granite launcher. And um, that is um, the reality, and that carries high morbidity. So the complications of this um, uh, kind of um, aggressive treatment uh, can include low blood pressure, abnormal heart rhythm, suppressed breathing, increased risk of infection. And then uh, we know that severity of complications is higher in patients who spend longer times in that medication induced uh, coma. Uh, with that, I will um, then um, hand the microphone uh, to Dr. Ko, who will be speaking uh, about pediatric aspects of uh, mortality and noise and fires. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to uh, start my talk by uh, going through the EEG of one of my patients that um, uh, really was inspiration for me to be involved in fires and Norse uh, clinical uh, um, workshop and, and also to 
perform um, experiments using animal model. Um, this was a beautiful, previously completely healthy six-year-old um, who presented um, one week after having had a urinary tract infection and initially showed intermittent focal seizures and one of which was captured on day one. And next. Um, she needed to be put on pentobarbital induced sub birth suppression by day two because all the conventional anticonvulsant failed to stop her uh, intermittent then becoming status epilepticus. He, she had a very subtle signs of eye blinking. Next. And when we tried to uh, ease her down and off a uh, pentobarbital coma, um, EEG was become incredibly uh, aggressive as you can see. Mm -hmm. Next. And we had to put her back on uh, pentobarb coma uh, and induced even further um, its medication and with the prolonged suppression. Next. And whenever we try to ease off the coma, uh, she would have this burst of uh, highly abnormal activity. And during this very aggressive treatment, uh, uh, she uh, experienced a renal failure. Next. And by the day 21, despite um, many different, I would say we, uh, we probably counted up, up to uh, uh, 20 different medications, um, uh, she was having continuous seizures. And next, in day 23, uh, she expired uh, due to respiratory failure despite her being intubated, but even until the very uh, last minute, um, her EEG was quite active, and and um, and really that's what uh, inspired me to. And at this time, when I arrived at Emory University at the time, uh, three out of three fires cases, and it was they were both all of them were retrospectively diagnosed. Uh, uh, we lost them. Next. So as we've heard, fires, the febrile infection-related epilepsy syndrome um, is a subcategory of NORS and, and, and definition by definition, it requires prior febrile illness with fever starting two, to, two weeks uh, or to 24 hours prior to seizures uh, with rapidly progressive status epilepticus. And we do know that at the time when she, they initially present, they could either have fever or not. But I think the important point here is this, um, although the, the fires can present at any age, it's most common in children, a median age of eight years, and used to be called, the fires used to stand for school age children. And that is um, very difficult for many families to accept because these are perfectly um, well developing with no prior history. And, and once they arrive into the hospital, um, um, these once the fire starts, um, really it seems almost irreversible. Next. The outcome is bismal. Um, we haven't done any better uh, in the past 10 years. Um, initial um, report in 2010 uh, showed 9% mortality, um, 77 cases presented by Cremor in 2011 reported about 12% mortality. And here they noticed that the longer duration of birth uh, suppression was correlated poor outcome. They also noted in this uh, paper that ketogenic diet was uniquely helpful in, in improving the uh, morbidity and mortality. And the most um, more recent uh, cases of 29 cases presented by Lee et al. in 2018, again, showed 10% uh, mortality in acute phase. And um, a majority, a vast majority, continuing with drug-resistant epilepsy, where over 48% uh, are having a severe in, uh, um, intellectual disability. Next. So what we really, go ahead, we can Sorry. <laughs> we need to do better. And this is what really um, 
uh, we got together and uh, led to um, some of the papers that were recently published. These are all 2020. Uh, go, go ahead. And we came together as a group to propose to optimize evaluation treatment of febrile infection related epilepsy syndrome. I uh, had a virus workshop for the past three years. Next. And I just want to uh, live in a hopeful, um, a brighter future, uh, hoping for a brighter future where we, we, we are currently developing a network to investigate um, to, and to generate a consensus guidelines for recognition, treatment, um, and, and future research on uh, North and Fires. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you both for going over uh, the topic. I know that question has come up a lot about uh, why people can die from fires in Norris. And so thank you for reviewing that. I think next we'll have Dr. Payne who will uh, review some of the, you know, kind of hope for the future and maybe some emerging treatments. Thanks for Thanks for the uh, the invite. Uh, I've really enjoyed the talks today. I learned uh, quite a bit. Let me know if you guys are seeing that. Is that the right slide coming up for you? You guys seeing the presentation yes. mode? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So <laughs> I've been asked to uh, to talk a little bit more about neuroinflammation um, and and especially as it relates to uh, treatment options. Um, <clears throat> I am a, a pediatric epilepsy specialist, and I also uh, spend a lot of time in the ICU doing neurocritical care. Uh, and so uh, very much um, have seen a lot of, of these patients over, over the years as a result of that experience. Uh, I, as mentioned, did receive a, a, an award from Norse uh, along with Chuck Howitt Mayo Clinic um, to, to look at this specific protein. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the goals of this talk are, are, are twofold. I, I will discuss just a few of the neuroinflammatory targets that have already sort of been alluded to, especially the NLRP3 inflammasome and interleukin-6. And then We'll discuss some treatment options, especially the ketogenic diet, anakinra, and tocilizumab. Um, and so Dr. Ko just, just alluded to this, this paper uh, in Epilepsia Open. Um, and, and in that, we did, um, the group of 20 of us, uh, try to come up with some, some recommended treatment options. Um, this is sort of the, the, the take-home uh, slide in terms of treatment. Um, but we, you, know, you are in a rock in a hard place. You've got these seizures that are not stopping. And if you don't use these medicines that can cause harm, um, they continue to seize. Uh, so you're trying to uh, avoid prolonged anesthetics, but, but oftentimes it's really tough to do that. It's tough to get them. You can get them to stop usually by getting them to stay stopped is, is what's tough. And so while you're using the anesthetics, we also talk about adding in things like steroids, which is IV methylprednisolone, IVIG, which you've heard about, um, and, and then also talking about starting the ketogenic diet. Uh, and then we'll talk about anakinra here. Um, and, and when this was discussed, uh, there weren't really any case reports in pediatrics for tocilizumab, but some have arisen now. So, you know, probably I think tocilizumab is after anakinra here now. Uh, and um, in terms of CBD, so cannabidiol, a lot of families ask about that. There's one, one trial only. Um, it, it only looked at, I think, about seven children. Only one or two of those kids got uh, cannabidiol in the acute phase. And most of them got it in the chronic phase when the seizures weren't, weren't stopping or still refractory. And uh, the majority of those patients did have some, some improvement, but it has not been shown uh, early on to be, be very helpful, but it probably doesn't cause harm. And so starting it at any point probably doesn't, doesn't make too much of a difference, but you, you have to watch levels because some of our seizure meds interact with this stuff. Um, just looking at this box here, so I mentioned steroids, diet, specific anti-inflammatory meds, which we'll talk about. There are less specific immunosuppression meds. Um, so, so Coral went through that the fact that some of these patients can be antibody mediated. And so because of that, we use meds like rituximab that drop down your B cells and B cells produce antibodies. Um, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, these are um, sort of broad spectrum and immunosuppression meds. There's a recent case report just this month, actually, um, six or seven children that were treated with intrathecal, which means we gave the steroids right into the spinal fluid um, through like a lumbar puncture or some sort of drain. Um, and, and it seemed to, to help decrease um, admission length. But, you know, all of this stuff I'm talking about is very low level evidence. So we're talking about case series, um, case reports only. Um, but, you know, when we're in the uh, in, in the situation where, we're, where we can't get the seizures to stop, um, these are the medicines at the bottom here that we start start to go to. So there are a few cases for, for each of these. Um, in, in a nice review uh, that Dr. Gaspard uh, 
authored in, as the first author, you can see what, what was in the literature at the time. So a lot of steroids, 70%, 17% had some, some benefit um, to that. IVIG, 5%. Um, but ketogenic diets seem to be helpful. And in adults, uh, hypothermia potentially. Um, but a lot of the other meds I mentioned at the bottom here, there really weren't anything in the literature. Um, so mentioned um, that there is a, a aberrant inflammation in the innate immune system. So as opposed to antibodies, uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of the IL-1 story because IL-1 is where anakinra works. Um, and essentially you can think of the IL-1 system as, as having balance to evolve. It's uh, uh, evolved to balance itself over time. And the main players are the ones in red. So this is interleukin-1 beta, and, and this is interleukin receptor antagonist. Uh, and so your, your body's waiting to fight inflammation. Uh, it's ready to, 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 to really get this thing going. And then here are the breaks. And if you don't have the breaks, then, then the inflammation can get out of whack. And we have uh, documented at least one, one child with, with fires that the breaks were dysfunctional and she needed to be on a Kinra. Uh, IL-18 is also important. And that was asked about this morning. And that's the reason um, because of this, this inflammasome. So don't get lost on, on the details here, but the part of the point is to show you how complex this is. And, and this is why it's so tough to figure out what's going on for an individual child with fires. Um, but this is the inflammasome. The whole point of this, this protein is to produce these two proteins here, interleukin-1 beta and IL-18. So it's a pro-inflammatory cascade. Um, and there's a signal that comes uh, from outside the cell, and then there's all this other stuff that happens. Um, there are interesting new drugs um, being looked at yeah, target P2X7. We heard about some of these alarmins and reactive oxygen species. So there's a lot going on in this inflammatory cascade. And so it's tough to sort of pinpoint what, what we need to, to, to go after. Um, diet therapy, uh, it, you know, because this disease is going to be heterogeneous, meaning that there's not one specific cause for this, um, is, is, is um, appealing because it, it attacks the immune system in multiple ways. So, so one way it does that is by producing lots of, you know, the fat breakdown product is, is beta hydroxybutyrate. Um, and, and it actually acts directly on that inflammasome I just showed you. Uh, so it pre prevents the production of these things, um, uh, among other, uh, other ones. And I'll point a few of these things out. If you want a review on this, um, really nice review by uh, Dr. Ko recently that just, just came out uh, looking at neuroinflammation in the ketogenic diet. And it, it is uh, an, another complicated story, and I won't get, get into this, but there are a lot of different pathways uh, through which the diet is probably acting. So our, our involvement with, my involvement with, with, with fires uh, started in training. I had uh, seen a few patients in Calgary and as well in, in fellowship, and one of the last patients in Toronto that I followed was a, a six-year-old boy who, who, had, who had fires, and I think about three months only after joining Mayo Clinic, um, I met this young girl uh, shortly, shortly after Christmas, and she was two and, and probably by day two or three, we kind of knew what we were dealing with um, and, and serendipitously ended up trying Anakinra, partly because of a conversation with Anna Maria Vizani at the time. Um, but Anakinra, as I'll tell you, has been around for, for a while. It's been it's used in other uh, rheumatological diseases. It's been shown to be safe longitudinally. Uh, and, and because I sort of had this experience where I saw these kids just do awful afterwards, we, we made the decision early on day six, actually, to try Anakinra. And so this, what this graph shows you is the days of admission, and this is how much seizures they were having on EG. Uh, and there were a lot of meds going on. Ketogenic diet was started, um, and midazolam infusions. But when we started the Anakinra here, uh, her seizures stopped. And then she developed a, a bad drug reaction, and we didn't know what it was causing it, so we had to stop, pull back on a lot of things. In my experience, you know, uh, phenobarbital can cause that, but we do know that a lot of kids with, with fires get dressed. Uh, so we had to come off the meds here. And when we did that, uh, about 16 days, uh, and then she started having clinical seizures and we put her on EEG and she had, uh, you know, one, one hour full of seizures. Um, and so, you know, we, we tried to control it with other things, but we weren't getting there. So we made the decision to add Anakinra back on. Uh, and at that point, the seizure stopped again. Um, I, in fact, took it away uh, three months later and, and on the ward and, and she started having seizures. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that. But, but the other thing we had here were cytokines. So we could measure some of that inflammation. So IL-1 beta. Um, IL-6 and IL-8, these were all elevated before anakinra treatment in her spinal fluid, and they decreased on treatment. Uh, so we had response to a very targeted drug uh, and, and these sort of investigations that helped. Uh, her, her story has been, been really interesting. So we got her off anakinra about six months later, um, and then within a year, she presented uh, as a, a systemic lupus-like picture, which 
kids don't that young don't usually get. So she's now back on Anakinra and she's probably been on Anakinra now for four years at a very good dose and, and um, has a seizure once every couple of months um, in the context of usually infection uh, and is in a normal classroom functioning very well. Um, we went on to look at her uh, blood more closely uh, with the help of my collaborator, Chuck Howe at Mayo Clinic uh, while I was still there. And, and what we found with, with this particular patient was that uh, she was able to produce the brakes but the brakes weren't working. And so when we added anakinra, uh, which works as, as the brakes, uh, things sort of stopped. Um, there was one of our trainees at the time uh, moved on to Wisconsin and, and they came across, heard about a 21 year old who was on the adult ward. Uh, and she had been in the hospital for, for 30 days um, when they, and these are all the different meds. And they decided to start anakinra here around day 30. Um, and you can see that her seizures, these black gray box here stopped very quickly right afterwards. And she's actually returned back to college. Uh, and if you're interested in her story, she was highlighted in, in Science Magazine in December because of the, the, the response. And so one of the point take home messages here is that it's, it, you know, we want to start it as early as possible, but in, you, you have nothing to lose trying it late. And you sometimes might get a, a, a very good response. Um, this uh, was uh, a long uh, effort um, led by um, Dr. Lei, um, Ayala Muscal, and Dr. Riviello. Um, basically, um, about 20 plus authors each contributed one patient, which was a pediatric cryptogenic fires who was treated with anakinra. This was just published in uh, December. Um, we had 25 kids. They were on it for about 83 days, up to 200 days. It was well tolerated, three developed dress. A couple of kids had drops in their their, their white cells and one had to stop because of infection. Uh, about half of the kids stayed on it at hospital discharge. So that's sort of a you know proxy that the physicians thought it was helping. Otherwise they wouldn't have kept it going. Uh, it did seem that the earlier you started, the, the better chance you had. Uh, it did was associated with lower, you know, less uh, decreased length of stay and mechanical ventilation is the MV. Uh, and then in some of the patients where we had EG seizure burden, uh, you know, we saw a 50% reduction in seizures um, within a week in most, most patients. So very uh, heterogeneous group, some uh, confounded data, but um, you know, uh, ultimately we found that it was, it was safe. And I, as I say, you have, you have nothing to lose. There are a, a longstanding, you know, three, four year data where patients with systemic juvenile rheumatoid arthritis have taken this medicine very, very well. Um, just want to reiterate that point that if you are seeing a patient who's in that post-acute phase, so they're, they're coming to see you three, four, six months after their ICU admission, uh, there are some patients who do have active ongoing inflammation. Um, this is a case report by Dr. Vizani's group showing that it helped. And, and in my experience, having seen quite a few of these children at Mayo in the refractor in the, 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 this post-acute phase, there is inflammation going on in some of these patients. Uh, very quickly, interleukin-6, won't get into the details, but it also is a pro-inflammatory um, cytokine. Uh, and it, 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 uh, there is a, you know, a discussion between the innate immune system and our, on our antibodies, and it's not surprising that our T cells can get affected as well. Uh, but this is another instance here where uh, the ketogenic diet can help restore the balance of, of these T cells. So tocilizumab story uh, is an IL-6 blocker. Um, and it, it does not cross the blood-brain barrier as compared to uh, anakinra at doses over three per kilo. Uh, it's got a long half-life. So, you know, it takes it 13 days, almost two weeks for that dose to drop in half, whereas anakinra has got a half-life of six hours. So once you stop anakinra, it's basically out of your system within the next day or two, not the case with this. Um, there were some side effects, seven patients. Most of those patients actually had fires. And they did do some, some cytokine and they found that uh, six of the seven patients who received it um, did well. Um, there, were, there were side effects though, in, 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 substantial in two of the six. There are now a couple of case series and P's or case reports. Rather, these are two patients with, with pediatric fires, uh, essentially who, who responded well um, to tocilizumab, started after all the other meds we've talked about. And then Coral, who you just heard speak, uh, uh, has a, a paper, one child who uh, here, he was on anakinra. This is the, the, the diet therapy. And, and here we got tocilizumab and it was found that the, the tocilizumab, you don't want to use tocilizumab and anakinra at the same time, but um, when it was brought up afterwards, it, it, was, it was found to be helpful. So something else that we, could, we can try. I just get last thought in terms of treatment is, is neural stimulation. So we do know that the vagal nerve stimulator uh, does have, um, you know, some anti-inflammatory properties. It works on IL-1 pathway, among other things. 
Um, there are uh, also uh, patients now being evaluated in a lot of epilepsy centers for responsive neurostimulation, where we place a battery inside the skull. We have depth electrodes in different places in the brain that we determine to create seizures. Um, and so this was, I think, a kid about a year out from his uh, fires with multifocal seizures, who's had not only a, a response seizure-wise, but neurocognitively has had a really good outcome. Um, so there are things to consider in the chronic phase as well for these patients. Um, so to summarize, this is a, a adapted from a a figure that uh, Dr. Ko, myself, and Dr. Rule created um, for review in 2020. You know, you're going to you see these children going to be looking for a treatable cause. You start your status protocol. Uh, going to get them on a midazolam infusion or barbiturates to get the seizures to stop, and then you're going to start planning your exit strategy off of these infusions. Um, pulse steroids and IVIG. I mean, we don't even know if that is the right way to go, but because we don't know if this is antibody mediated, we sort of have to use these meds, but there's some thought that this could hurt the ability of anakinra to get into the brain, start the ketogenic diet. You know, there's not a, a, a timeline here, but I would say within the first week, you should be you know, for sure doing those things. And it's not the first few days. And a kinder should also be thought about in the first week. And then you've got all those other alternatives I sort of mentioned. Uh, I would I would bump up tocilizumab on this figure uh, below and a before before trying these other ones. Um, so in summary, patients with uh, fires in North, some of them anyways, have a barren neuroinflammation that responds well to targeted immunosuppression. Uh, the ketogenic diet has numerous anti-inflammatory mechanisms of action and should be considered early in the ICU admission. Uh, consider use of biologics, including anakinra and tocilizumab. And new on the drug horizon, uh, which I learned from Dr. Vizani's talk this morning, uh, were, were some of these other drugs that, that are not there yet, but, but there are, uh, it, this is, remains a very moving target with, with room for optimism, uh, even if anakinra and tocilizumab fail. And finally, we need, we need well-designed prospective trials because there's going to probably be differences between adults and peds. Maybe there won't be, but uh, with the Delphi study that, that Dr. Ko alluded to, we're trying to, to figure out you know, what is the best trials uh, to offer, and, and we need better, better data here. And with that, uh, I'll, I'll end and, and thank uh, the North Institute for their, their funding, um, and uh, as well as Mayo Clinic has also continued to fund some of these studies, and I'm, I'm getting uh, funding support as well here in, in, in Calgary. If there's any questions at any, any point, feel free to email me afterwards. Thank you so much for reviewing that with us, uh, Eric. Let's see, I think, um, Tanil, you were going to, Dr. Gofton was next going to help answer, moderate some questions. Okay, so for anybody who's new to Zoom and hasn't used it very much before, there is a chat feature at the bottom of your screen with a little uh, text bubble. You can click on that button and type messages in uh, to everyone. And then if you have a question, you can put it in there and we'll try and answer it. So there are a couple of questions that came up. I'll maybe just uh, touch on one of them that was answered in the chat briefly, and then we'll move on to the others. So uh, there was a question regarding uh, the electrographic, so the EEG definition and how to determine uh, status epilepticus um, and uh, which uh, reference to go to. And so Dr. Hirsch uh, referred uh, the person asking the question to the uh, American Clinical Neurophysiology Society um, who just uh, released a new guideline with regards to uh, electrographic uh, status epilepticus. And so um, that is a good place to go for uh, reference. Um, and if the website is uh, something that we can put into the chat, uh, and oh, Dr. Hirsch has actually put it into the chat already. So um, one of the questions that came up through the talks, and I think this could be directed probably to adult uh, epileptologists, but is it does insomnia or taking sleep aids uh, at all relate to the development of Norse? I'll comment on that. Um, taking sleep aids, I would say no, but it is, I mean, insomnia is extremely common, but in someone who ends up with Norse, ins insomnia has been well described as a very common feature as part of the anti-NMDA syndrome, both as a prodrome, meaning before the severe illness and in later phases. So that's the only way I could relate it as one of the features of anti-NMDA. Okay, thanks. Um, another question actually relates a little bit to anti-NMDA. Um, and the question I'm just reading from the chat in case anyone can't see it is, could cryptogenic Norse and fires be a separate or distinct uh, clinical phenomenon compared to other Norse and fires? Uh, and so other Norse and fires clinical cases with known biological pathways. So 
Would anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis essentially be different from other cases of NORS? I think that would be a pediatric or adult question. I can comment on that. Um, uh, so there was a recent study when um, the scientists tried to separate two conditions, um, um, NORS with NMDA encephalitis and NORS that had no um, known causes or cryptogenic NORS. And uh, there was a clear distinction in terms of how the two conditions present. For example, in the cases with um, an MDA um, antibodies, patients presented oftentimes with psychosis, abnormal movements, and that was not present in cryptogenic NORS. And instead, patients kind of transitioned quietly into severe seizures rather than demonstrating this other florid clinical symptoms. So. Um, it even led to the creation of um, uh, cryptogenic NORS index uh, that would allow uh, physicians to suspect early that perhaps they're dealing with a cryptogenic NORS. And uh, while they're waiting for the antibodies to come back, they would already kind of suspect that this is what they're dealing with. So um, whether it's truly to uh, whether cryptogenic is truly unknown or whether we will eventually discover some unknown antibodies um, is still you know up in the air the question is not answered but um, there is, seems to be clear distinction at least um, in cases with anti-nmda from the from the rest of unknown from the rest of the encephalitis without um, known causes and norse uh, uh, I'd like to further comment on the uh, potentially distinct entity um, in, in children. And I think um, what has been at least uh, noted in a uh, few cases, this, this break that uh, Eric has been talking about with the interleukin 1RA deficiency. And so I think that will be more likely um, uh, ideology or uh, Leading, leading to predisposition to have fires. Um, and in our experience in pediatrics, anti-NMD receptor antibody encephalitis, a very distinct uh, clinical entity, very rarely resembles fires. So there was a little bit of um, confusion in the beginning, whether anti-NMD encephalitis should be included in fires as part of the ideology for fires, because they're such a distinct entity, mm -hmm. most in our clinical experience has been that they're very different in, in our um, uh, population. Um, so yes, I agree that it, it probably is a, a different, uh, different uh, entity for, for uh, fires, uh, cryptogenic fires, as opposed to, um, and time MD receptor encephalitis. Yeah. If I could just make a comment here too, one of the things I find hilarious about the anti-NMDA, and it's important to remember this, but you know, 15 years ago, we didn't even know that that antibody existed. So you could you could present that at a conference of 300 neurologists, and nobody knew that what that was. And now we see it, and we we know what it is in 30 seconds. Um, so there are antibodies out there that we don't know about, and and so that's why we have things like steroids and IVIG that are early in the pathway because we cannot exclude that um, with certainty at the beginning. Yeah, I was going to make that. That same point. I agree. The anti-NMDA has very specific features, but other than those specific features for that one, um, actually in the Gaspard series that you presented, we specifically looked at that, comparing all the cryptogenic cases to the ones with ultimately with uh, some etiology identified, and there was no difference at all in the spinal fluid, in the EEGs, in the imaging. Um, and almost no difference in clinical features, the only exception being the uh, hallucinations, which were the NMDA. So the psychiatric syndromes in NMDA. So other than that, the cryptogenic cases look very similar, at least in the adult world, we tend to treat all of them the same because we're treating them very early with immune modulation anyway. Thanks. So another question that's come up next is uh, how often should we ask for panels? I think referring to the cytokine panels that Eric, you were describing. And also, um, is it beneficial for children in the chronic pay phase, so about four years out after the acute phase, to look into anakinra or uh, tocilizumab? And I think to go along with that, it might be helpful to answer, um, are cytokine panels available to everybody clinically, or are they just a research tool? 
So I can I can I can talk, speak to that. Um, I'll actually show you guys a slide that I gave at AAS here. Um, so cytokine measurements have limitations. I think that they're uh, absolutely have a, have a role here. And as we try to learn about this disease, we need to be collecting these things. Um, but as you'll see here, there's a lot of limitations to them. So, you know, where are you measuring things? Is this in the spinal fluid or in the blood? Um, it's it's not always easy to get spinal fluid in these these children, especially not on repeated measures. Because how do you you know you can't lumbar puncture children every month to figure this stuff out. Um, so a lot of the stuff we're doing is in the blood, but as you know, there's this blood brain barrier. And so, uh, you know, what's happening in the serum might not necessarily be relevant in, in, in the brain. Um, and which cytokines are you measuring is another important point. So when we were at Mayo, we were doing an ELISA that measured 10 to 15 cytokines. Uh, and now in Calgary, we work with a company that can get uh, 65 cytokines and they get that back to us in a week. So uh, there's a big difference there. You know, when are you drawing the sample? So you're getting this before the seizures have started, or are you getting this, um, um, you know, a week out um, there there are so many confounders there uh, and probably most importantly we need multiple time points um, because as, as you heard this is a, a moving target inflammatory uh, wise uh, and so one sample only gives you one time point we know medications we know illness and we know uh, uh, you know the seizures themselves are all potential confounders meaning that each of these things can influence and affect the the inflammation that you see uh, so the, the bottom line is I think you collect them if you can um, there are some places in the states like Cincinnati that will do it. We have uh, ways of getting it pretty robustly here as well. Um, but it's not a reason to hold off on the treatment. So even though we got cytokines on our initial anakinra kid, um, we started anakinra well before we got any of those results back. So if you have a high index of suspicion, I think you go ahead and you treat. Thanks so much. Um, there are a couple of uh, questions that were put into the chat or into the registration forms actually that aren't showing up in the chat for everybody. So I'll read uh, one or two of those out. We still have a few minutes left. One of the questions was uh, essentially describing how a family member had had exposure to a virus about 20 days prior to start of seizures. Uh, but that person was also under extreme stress. And the question is whether or not the virus exposure as well as the stress could have triggered the norse. It's always, um, Difficult to say in any particular case, but certainly uh, with the possibility of a uh, uh, fever and an infectious illness before the onset of status epilepticus, the two could be related. Um, there's another question. Let me just read that. So fires tends to be the diagnosis for children. Uh, when they become an adult, does the diagnosis change to Norse or is that one of the reasons for combining the two or making fires a subdiagnosis of Norse? Larry, do you want to take that with the definitions? Um, yeah, there was really just no rationale for using different terms in different ages. That was just a historical feature. So um, it's basically Norse with or without prior febrile illness, and that can happen at any age. So now we'll be, we can study pediatric Norse and pediatric fires and compare it to adult Norse, adult fires. Um, so that, that's really why, and you'll see, it's not just those two names, there were many others used um, and different ones in kids versus adults. So it's now all basically put into one, the overall Norse spectrum with fires being one subcategory of that. And now we can, can compare different ages and see how different they actually are. And they do seem to be somewhat different. Okay. Um, so we're reaching the end of our uh, 10 minutes or for the panel question and answer, and we now have scheduled a 10 minute break. Uh, Krista, do you have any final words before we take that break? No, I think it looks like there's still some questions in the chat that we didn't get to. I think we can, um, I'll see if there's a way that we can, uh, if anyone wants to gradually kind of answer some of those and we can get to them. We have some other sessions too, where some of that information may come up as well. Yeah, I'd be happy to stay for a few minutes. If some people want to take a break and come back, you can just uh, mute your screen and stop your video. Uh, but I can stay for the 10 minutes. Yeah, I'll stay for another couple of minutes too for, to answer a couple of those. Fabulous. Okay, so uh, one of the next questions is uh, from a survivor uh, asking about uh, using CBD oil prescribed and having more seizures after uh, trying the CBD oil as opposed to fewer seizures. And the question was, could that be due to interference with the other medications? Um, 
So there's a lot of research uh, that is ongoing with CBD and different seizures. I don't think it's actively in people who have seizures after Norse or fires uh, because it's such a small group. But we do know that CBD oil can interact with anti-seizure medications and change levels for some of them. Um, and we know that uh, CBD or cannabis can, for some people, exacerbate their seizures and some people make them better. So it seems to be very, uh, very specific to an individual situation. I don't know if any of the other uh, panelists have uh, experience with that. Yeah, I've, uh, I, we were one of the recruiting sites for the cannabidiol trial uh, and the one of the patients uh, that I had been following for a few years that was enrolled had never had status before uh, hey trial epidiolex uh, and and had to come off that so the side of the side effects um, are, are there uh, for sure the the info especially with clobazam but I think it, it has the ability to make things worth by itself yeah I've, I've seen that as well although I will point out it's not unique to CBD almost any anti-seizure drug will occasionally worsen seizures instead probably about five percent of with most drugs I was going to add that we had anecdotal experience in a couple of patients on ketogenic diet and epidiolex, and they showed them um, um, increased uh, uh, rate of infections, uh, particularly urinary tract infections and aspiration pneumonia. And so um, with those frequent infections, we kind of had difficulty to maintain ketosis uh, really well. So we end up uh, discontinuing epidiolex in, in a couple of patients on keto diet. Okay, thank I you. Can, I can take the COVID question. Go for it. So there has been at least one reported case of post-COVID Norse, I mean, after a COVID developing Norse. And I've seen um, one and a half cases. One was actual Norse, the other was not quite refractory status, was just frequent seizures. Um, so like most viruses, occasionally there's an overactive immune process after that seems to cause a Norse or Norse-like syndrome but fortunately it's rare. Another question from a registrant uh, that was put in and submitted before the session is, if a child in the acute stage responds positively to immunotherapy but continues to suffer seizures in the chronic phase, how can a, uh, their clinician determine whether or not this is fires or a treatable ongoing autoimmune epilepsy? I'll let Eric take that because I asked him that exact <laughs> question recently. Yeah, I, I think, um... It, we, it, it's a moving target. It just says we, we don't always know if we're dealing with an antibody mediated or an auto inflammation at the beginning. Um, when we see patients um, in the post acute phase months out, that's the question. You know, are, are they still have epilepsy because uh, of all the damage that took place during the acute phase, or is there active inflammation happening? So I think if you, you know, from my perspective, if, if, if you've had, maybe some of these are soft signs, maybe they did have a partial response to some of the anti-inflammatory things already. Certainly if they haven't tried anakinra and you're dealing with somebody who still has some encephalopathy, meaning they're altered thinking and lots of seizures, there's no downside to trying anakinra at that point. So I think just like we did with, with our first case, you just have to try it and see if it gets better. You know, usually pretty quickly if it helps, but sometimes you have to go for a month or two to sort of tell. Um, this, you know, the cytokines are, are, are something that can help you as well, um, but you're going to have to be willing to probably do a lumbar puncture in the chronic phase on the, on the patient to see what's actually going on in the CSF. Uh, and then you're going to be waiting for some time for those tests to come back. Um, and, you know, I've seen some patients who do this cyclically. So post chronic, I've got one patient that fires 10 years ago and every month, it goes into three days of encephalopathy and seizures. So in that patient, we're trying to pick up the, the, the inflammatory stuff over time, but we're, you know, we're stuck measuring serum. So uh, it, it is really tough. I think it's kind of trial and error. And the reason we were able to use Anakinra was because I think there's enough information to tell us that it was safe uh, and that the risk benefit in those, in that case was, was so, so bad. And I, I think that that also holds true for the kids you're seeing chronically who are not doing well. Thank you. There's another question about scans here. So when searching for a possible perineoplastic encephalitis as a cause, are full body scans recommended in addition to just an MRI of the brain? And what if there's a persistent tumor somewhere that's driving the immune system and keeping it agitated? Anybody can answer this one. I think it's pretty common in a workup for Norse or fires that we will do either a CT scan of the chest, abdomen and pelvis or do a PET scan, depending on what's available within your facility where the ICU is um, to be looking for a tumor that is associated with that presentation. So it's, it's case by case, but certainly if you're concerned about a cancer as the cause, then we will go looking for that. 
Yep, I agree. We, we always do CT, chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and usually look at, uh, we'll do uh, testicular ultrasound or uh, pelvic ultrasounds as well, looking for ovary and testicular lesions. And then, and if we still think there's a reasonable chance we haven't found anything, then the whole body pet, oh, that's harder to get. I also tend to continue workup if, uh, for certain antibody positive um, NORS cases, I continue the malignancy workup for up to two years with repeated scans. Um, of course, if, if the tumor uh, suspicion is high, for example, for an MDA, patients who are not doing well and not perfectly controlled on immunotherapy always think that maybe you missed tumor on the original scan. So I would repeat it every nine months for up to two years. Thank you. Yeah, those are all good points. Um, the next question is, is anakinra used for treating patients after the acute Norse fires phase um, in the follow-up phase? And we kind of touched on this. Mm. Do you have yes, any more is. comments? No, there's, a, a, um, there's a, at least that one publication by Dr. Vizani's group showing it helps. Um, and I, we, we've used it in other kids as well. Um, definitely given it a try though, and it hasn't worked. So, um, you know, it, it's really frustrating when that, when that happens, but, but that is also, that's also possible. And then there's a couple of comments that I, I think have been addressed. Um, are there challenges getting the CSF cytokine panel results in a timely manner? And I think you've talked about that, Eric, how it's faster now than it was mm. even a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's another comment about how uh, the treatment for Norse right now is similar to the history of tuberculosis until the biological pathways uh, truly identified a lot of uh, diseases were treated similarly, and that's a really good point. There are probably multiple, well, we know there are multiple causes for Norse or fires, but we approach them in a similar way right now because we are still trying to understand the pathways fully. Okay, there's a couple more questions still. Oh my goodness, there's 14 more questions. It's wonderful that everybody's asking. So if drugs don't help to stop seizures in fires chronic phase and all known medications have been tried, what would be your advice? Um, would you keep using medication or stop it, it, in view of the fact that it might not be helping and is only causing side effects? I presume that's anti-seizure medications. Well, my short answer is to consider surgery or devices at that yeah. point and diet if that wasn't already tried. Okay, and next question we have is tocilizumab is not currently listed as a treatment for seizures, which makes it difficult to get in insurance coverage, um, where I have uh, yeah, comments on the regional variations in insurance coverage. Um, it also seems to be in a circle of being refused and uh, where you have to ask different insurers. Um, how do medications such as tocilizumab become listed as seizure control from an insurance perspective? Certainly, I just comment on that in, in Ontario anyway, with off-label uses for medications, we have a very difficult time getting um, approval to use them. And so it, it certainly access is an issue. Are there it highlights the, the I was just gonna think it highlights the importance of some of the prospective trials that were mentioned and getting those together, that that might help give more data to help support the use of some of these different medications and help with that struggle. Exactly. And pub publications help as well, even yes. case reports. Yep. And sometimes pointing out that there's no specific FDA approved treatments for these diseases, and that these are some of the treatments that have worked in a small number of series or case reports. I've sometimes had luck um, using that line of thinking with insurance companies for approval. One of the, the things that I've seen over the years, uh, even with the data, Anna Kinner still gets denied. Um, the, the company that produces it, Sobe, is very generous, especially when you're talking about PEDS fires cases. So they just started another child uh, uh, that I'm following for free on the medication. And uh, the, our initial Anna Kinner patient that's been on it for four years has been receiving the drug for free for four years. So uh, you can sometimes reach out to, to them. They're and I think sometimes it's helpful to partner with rheumatology uh, colleagues who are very used to using these uh, immunomodulatory therapy. And when all else fails, I sometimes have them come to the hospital and the inpatient coverage is much better than outpatient prior authorization. But that's the little trick of the trade. Yeah, certainly that varies by region. 
Okay, uh, there's a question about the, do any of the panel have experience with Xcopri or Sinobamate? Um, it's a new medication. Um, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, we're using it a lot for very refractory epilepsy cases now. It's a new drug that's very effective for epilepsy. My one concern is its its main risk is of uh, a severe allergic reaction, um, and having an immune underlying disorder might be a risk factor for that. So you have to be careful, and you have to give it very slowly. It takes a couple of months to start it to minimize that risk. Um, and if you've had a lot of rashes to prior drugs, I'd probably stay away from it. Uh, but other than that, it's a good option and it's looking very promising as far as being effective. Okay, there are two more questions. Um, and I think after that, we'll proceed to the talks. Krista, do you wanna move ahead with the talks and we could put this in the next question and answer? Yeah, I think that sounds great. Um, I mean, you're the, one, you're the one who's talking next. So it depends how much time you feel like you feel like you need, so. Well, hopefully we can everyone answer. Who, I was going to say, uh, hopefully everyone who needed a break got one. Fair enough. Okay. I'll, I'll answer the prostate one in 10 seconds. So I was going to okay. say no, but then I looked in PubMed and there's one case report of status epilepticus from an unusual form of prostate cancer with anti-GABA B receptor. So extremely rare. Okay, so Krista introduced me earlier on. Uh, my name's Tamil Gofton. I didn't repeat it at the beginning of the Q&A session. I'm an associate professor at Western University and I will change my display settings. There we go. Um, and I work in neurocritical care and I also work in uh, palliative neurology. So one of the topics that uh, I'm gonna touch on through the workshop or in today and tomorrow is challenges in communication um, during times of uncertainty because with Norsen fires, as I think everybody attending here knows, there's a great deal of uncertainty. So if we take a step back and just think about communication and healthcare all, uh, all together, communication between the healthcare team and families is essentially the core of providing good healthcare. Uh, there's a history uh, going back of uh, potentially poor communication between healthcare teams and the patients and families. And that's really been identified as an issue and examined with research over the last few years. So the goal is to improve the healthcare team and family communication. And this has certainly been a focus of research in critical care, also in cancer and other areas of medicine. And in Norser fires, there are a lot of junctures where communication is really difficult, uh, but so important to, to patient care and family-centered care. So when we think about challenges that are specific to Norse, um, I would consider Norse to be an acute catastrophic illness, meaning the person who's affected by Norse was previously healthy and this happened all of a sudden. And it really, as we've talked about, can have catastrophic consequences. And it can be really difficult to explain Norse and fires. Um, as the healthcare team, it can be difficult to explain this phenomenon to a family uh, because you're discussing something that has not necessarily a clear trigger in that moment. Um, and that the person was previously healthy. So it's very difficult, difficult initially to explain why it's happened. It's also difficult for the family to take this information in because um, there's not really a lot of reason uh, from a cognitive point of view as to why this happened, but it's hard to explain the diagnosis to people around you. So if you haven't heard of Norse or fires and you're just learning from the doctors about it, it's also difficult to explain it to the people around you in your life because the people around you think, well, I've never heard of that. I don't know what it is. And you have to repeatedly explain it when you're, when you're talking about it. Also, when we talk about Norse and fires, we've spoken about the fact that it can affect people who are any age, but often young people and often previously healthy people. Specifically in Norse, but also in other uh, catastrophic illnesses, the healthcare team has unfortunately never had the opportunity to meet their patient in person or to get to know them in person themselves. And so as a healthcare team, the onus is on us to learn, is to learn everything about our patient from the family or from their substitute decision makers and the people in their circle uh, of support. And to coupled with that is that the medical care for Norse and fires is exceedingly complex and it might involve multiple medical services. So depending on the hospital that the person is admitted to and their structure, there might be the critical care team who's the most responsible physician or doctor. And then there's a neurology team that gets consulted and there's a neurophysiology team that helps take care of the EEG and there's an infectious disease specialist and there might be the rheumatologist and there's many different medical services who get consulted. 
So there's a lot of different messages um, at play. And Norse and fires, as, as uh, Nora highlighted at the very beginning, is a rare disorder. And so individual healthcare provider knowledge of Norse, of the treatments for Norse, the possible prognosis and outcomes can also vary from place to place. We're fortunate today to have a group together a group, uh, people who are very interested in Norse and obviously have a great deal of knowledge about it, but that's not necessarily going to be the case in every care setting. So as everybody here is aware, there are a lot of unknowns with Norse. Um, what we do know is the medical team is that it's common to have changes in your health or your health status after surviving Norse. Um, life isn't usually the same as it was before uh, Norse happened. Uh, there's a wide variety of outcomes, and I think uh, Dr. Ko and Dr. Tereshenko went through this earlier. You know, there might be mild cognitive changes, there might be a return to almost uh, the same place the person was at before, but there might also be severe deficits and dependency, and those can be changes that are physical, cognitive, and emotional. And refractory epilepsy, meaning seizures that are very difficult to control, are very common afterwards. Um, and unfortunately, death is a common outcome, and it can happen in a, a, about 20% of people who are initially affected by Norse or fires. For those who do recover, recovery can be very long after emerging from coma. Um, and this is a really long road of rehabilitation and trying to return to normal life. So other challenges are, are the fact that the timing of different therapies uh, that we know are indicated are not very well established. Um, we've talked today about the earlier the better always, but there's challenges with that with regards to access to medications and uh, ruling out other causes and making sure that you are getting the medications in as quickly as you can. There's also unknowns with your treatments though about how long should we continue with curative focused treatments and when is that no longer possible? When has the Norse or fires progressed long enough that it's not recoverable? And when is it best uh, really for the, the patient and their values to, to move towards a palliative end of life focused treatment, even though that's not what anybody wants for the patient. So our standard approach is to be very aggressive at the outset um, and to treat aggressively in the ICU. But if all treatment, treatments do fail, then we have to consider an approach to care that's going to ensure comfort while allowing for a natural death. And this is a discussion that's really difficult to approach. So when we decide the best course of care for any patient in any medical setting, what we like to do is move uh, with a model that's called shared decision-making. Um, and this is, I think, intuitive in the name itself, but basically shared decision-making is a key component of patient-centered healthcare. It's a process where the doctors or the healthcare team and the patients or their uh, family and representatives work together to make uh, decisions, to choose what tests and treatments are best and to model the care plan based on the best clinical and, and research evidence that we have. The idea of shared decision-making is that we balance the risks and the expected outcomes of our medical treatments with what are the patient and family preferences and values so that we can tailor a care plan that is uh, in keeping with what the patient would want in that situation. So key to the shared decision-making process is that family and anyone participating or supporting uh, their loved one in this kind of situation has to have full information and complete understanding of what's going on from a medical point of view. And so from the healthcare team uh, end, we need to be openly acknowledging some of the uncertainties that are inherent to, to Norse and fires. And uh, in, in the conversation between uh, the healthcare team and families, it can be really difficult to convey those uncertainties and, and to share that. So I'm gonna take a step back because I know we probably have a very varied audience. Um, I'm gonna talk about health literacy just a little bit um, and a few campaigns that I find really helpful actually as a, as a doctor um, in shaping the discussions that I have with families. So health literacy, I think is an important concept. It's uh, the ability to read and understand information about your healthcare and to make decisions about it. Unfortunately, health, uh, below average health literacy is very common and that's not really a reflection of anybody's intelligence. It's a, often a reflection of access to appropriate information um, and uh, barriers for good health literacy are things like language barriers. If you're not able to get information about a medical issue in a language that's appropriate for you, then you can't take in that information. And the other uh, factor that often contributes to it is an ability to read or particularly understand the specific medical numbers or terminology. So if the language used is foreign to you in a discussion, it's very difficult for you to take that information in. I think um, 
health literacy is something that you can also compare to something like financial literacy. Some people are very well versed in, in financial discussions and some people have a hard time understanding them and, and it doesn't reflect on their intelligence, just what their background is and their ability to take that information in. So I wanted to leave uh, the group with some suggestions for maximizing discussions with your doctor. Um, these I've put references in the bottom. So if you're looking at these slides later, you can access them, but I think they're really uh, important nuggets to take away. Um, I think it's really important for your doctor to understand your role. Um, if you are a survivor of North Surf fires, um, then it may be you who's making your decisions and it may not be you. It might be a family member who's helping you and supporting you through that. And it's important for the doctor to know and understand who that is and who the important players for any decisions are so they can be there when the discussions take place. It's important to explain practical sides of your situation too. If you're always late to your doctor's appointments because the timing doesn't fit with when uh, transport can get you there or when your job is, then your doctor might be able to schedule you at different times. Um, but they, they won't know to do that unless you say so. It's also helpful to educate yourself, um, which clearly everybody who's present today is doing and interested in um, but about the condition and I think the internet is a good tool but it's important to stick with really reliable sources of information so that you can use that as a stepping stone to, to make a list of questions to ask your doctor when you're there and it's important to know that you can take time to make decisions about care so it's rare that a situation is truly life-threatening and where a decision needs to be made in that moment but if that's the case then the medical team will not hesitate to tell you most decisions, you can take an hour, you can take a day, you can take a week to think about them and get back to your healthcare team. It can be helpful um, in critical care, but also later on um, to appoint one family member as the main contact. Um, and this helps you sort out uh, and improve communication because it streamlines, streamlines and it makes sure that all of the healthcare team members who are talking to family actually give information to the one person. And so information isn't split in multiple different directions. And I think it's, it's your right and important for you to insist that conversations that take place with your healthcare team um, should take place in appropriate places. So if you run into your healthcare team in the hallway and they start talking about a patient care plan, it's a good time to say, hey, can we find a private room to have this discussion? It's easier for me to take in the information when I don't have distractions. Um, your healthcare team can also point you towards other resources um, and keeping a logbook or information where you can, uh, like a book where you can write down the information is really, really uh, helpful and important. It's also important when you're in a more of a, a longitudinal relationship with the doctor um, over time is to feel really comfortable with that doctor and, and have a trusting relationship with them. And if you don't, then it is in your right to, to ask for a different doctor or for a second opinion to make sure that you feel you're establishing communication with the doctor as you should be. I'm going to talk briefly about the Ask Me Three campaign. And as a doctor, I find this campaign actually really helpful because when I see uh, people in my uh, office or when I have a meeting with them in the ICU, I like to make sure I've addressed these three questions. So this is a campaign meant to uh, arm uh, patients and their families with uh, the tools to make sure that they've understood everything at their uh, medical appointment and how to um, maximize their information, essentially. So three main questions really should be answered. When you're leaving your doctor, you should know what is the main problem that we're currently trying to address? What do I need to do and what is the best way for me to address this? And why is it important for me to do this? Oftentimes, if you miss or you don't understand number three with why is it important to do this, then it's a lot harder to carry through on questions one and two because you don't understand the underlying importance. Another campaign that has a website with high visibility on the internet, if you go looking, is the Choosing Wisely campaign. Um, and this is tailored for different countries. There's one in the US and there's one in Canada, but this is, uh, they, it's an organization that uh, is there to help patients advocate for themselves and to help uh, medicine uh, reduce unnecessary investigations and tests. So important things to consider if there's tests that are being discussed is uh, what are the risks associated with this test? What are other options? So what else could be done aside from this test? And what happens if we don't do this test? And I think if you're considering an investigation, then these are really good answers that you should have in order to decide whether or not that test is the best thing for you. So if you don't understand at the end of the conversation, um, don't be shy to tell the person that you're having difficulty understanding that discussion. Um, maybe some of the language they're using is uh, still regular medical speak and could they use different words? Um, it's also important not to be nervous about asking questions because your healthcare team and your doctor really do want to answer these questions. 
And we have lots of good research data to tell us that people who understand healthcare instructions make fewer mistakes and have better outcomes from the point of view of their healthcare. So um, lastly, if you're having challenges with communication with your doctor, um, you know, your doctor probably wants to have good discussions with you. So it's important to bring up the fact that it's been difficult to understand or you're having some challenges and see if you can work through that. So in conclusion, um, communication in the face of North Rift virus is really difficult. Um, doctors and healthcare teams do want to improve their communication with you as families. Um, I think the, the real pin to that is shared decision making, which is the key. And don't be afraid to ask any questions, either simple or difficult. I'm going to stop share there so we can move forward. Thank you, Tania.